welcome to another Global Immersion webinar. We're thrilled you're with us. Um, this webinar will focus on women uh, as prophets and peacemakers and thrilled to introduce you to, to our guests and panelists today who will help us lean into this reality in some uh, new and nuanced ways. Uh, Global Immersion is a peacemaking training organization and uh, we our, our big picture vision is to activate and accompany the U.S. church uh, as an instrument of peace in our world, uh, because it largely hasn't been. And the more we think about the, the cost and the life of what it means to follow Jesus in our conflicted world, the more we realize the need and necessity for a theology and a practice for peace, a, a practice that moves us towards conflict, armed to heal rather than to win. And so we do that in a lot of creative ways. Um, um, working with churches primarily and with universities. And, and I'll unpack a few of the ways that you can engage with us here in a couple minutes. First off, for the sake of this webinar, I'm gonna toss a screen up here, a slide with information um, on our panelists. We encourage you to engage via social media. Um, and here is some info. Um, we have the hashtag women peacemakers when you are um, putting up quotes whether it's on twitter or facebook use that hashtag so we can follow the conversation along and and then uh, my name and twitter handle and then our panelists who you'll meet here in a couple minutes so grab that information uh like and or follow them on uh, twitter and facebook and let's make a conversation out of this also you'll notice in the um the q a function on zoom here you can jump in and interact um, with a larger community. So it, even if you want to jump in there now and, and say where you're listening from, uh, it'd be fun to see where this community extends to. Second, uh, in regards to global immersion, here's a couple ways you could engage with us in the next uh, couple months. Uh, April 27th, we'll be having a full day training and everyday peacemaking training as part of an Inhabit conference, which is an incredible conference for um, church leaders and practitioners focused on neighborhood expressions of the church. Uh, it's happening in Seattle, and uh, we'll have in our follow-up email ways for you to jump into that if you wanted to with us. We'll have uh, Rashida, who's on our panel uh, today. She'll actually be facilitating that with me um, up there in Seattle. We host uh, what we call Immigrants Journey Learning Labs down here on the border in San Diego, Tijuana, as a way to the move to the center of this immigration reality and conflict to learn from the peacemakers embedded within it. So if you want to come down to the border and have this immersive experience. Uh, it includes staying in deportation shelters, meeting with border patrol, and building a theology and practice that moves us constructively towards the other, uh, wherever, whoever and whatever that might look like in your context. We have two trips um, we call learning labs to Israel-Palestine, one in May, one in October, where we learn from Jews and Christians and Muslims working for peace uh, in that region uh, as a way to then translate back to our neighborhoods how to live as everyday peacemakers. So we'd love to have you involved in any of those uh, in the months to come. And we'll have uh, more information on that in the follow-up email. But for the sake of uh, this conversation uh, around women, you know, um, as we look at the state of our world right now, um, in our country specifically, even though we represent a couple different countries on this call, uh, the, the role and plight of women has become front and center to us, as it should be. And for me as a father, uh, I have four kiddos, I have three daughters um, who are, are, are growing and uh, being raised in this world. My awareness of the challenges they face has never been more real. Um, and never have I taken more seriously my and our role in releasing them uh, into their full identity and vocation um, as, as the reconciled beloved, as, as as women who are equipped to lead as everyday peacemakers. My oldest daughter, Ruby, is uh, six years old now, and her, her greatest aspiration is to be a peacemaker. She knows that daddy teaches peacemaking. That's all she understands of my job. And it, on the way to school every day, we pray on prayer street, as she calls it, what it, what's going to mean for her to be a peacemaker in school. And then when we pick her up, she talks about ways that she was a peacemaker, someone else was a peacemaker, ways she could grow as a peacemaker. and. Um, for, for her, seeing her as, um, as a woman who inherently baked into our culture is going to have more challenges than, than people like myself, a white male with privilege. I think of the opportunity um, and the sacred challenge that's in front of her 
and 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 I want to be committed to creating the space for her to thrive to whatever degree uh, is most possible. Jimmy Carter, um, former president and now current uh, activist, recently wrote a book, and he says the abuse of women is the primary human rights issue in the world today. Uh, and we don't have to look far for that to that statement to be affirmed. And, and reality is, in some of our systems and structures, we might think, well. Like the woman and man equality conversation is over. Like it's all, everyone's got the same opportunity. And while we may say that, um, in, in reality, the systems and structures don't reflect that. And while we may say we, we all believe that we're made equal in the sight of God, in practice, things look very different. Um, we would argue that religion is actually often used as a primary tool that leads to the ongoing oppression of women. You know, the three monotheistic faiths, Judaism and Islam and Christianity, are cited often in this conversation. For us as Christians, we, we have to take on our contribution to this, understanding uh, that first and foremost, Jesus' life and message is one of liberation for all people, but specifically in a, in a first century patriarchal context was unbelievably liberating for women into their sacred vocation as equal participants in God's mission of reconciliation. And so as Jesus comes as, a, as the message and embodiment of liberation, we have to acknowledge that patriarchy, like this lens of looking at the world and scripture through a dominant culture of men and maleness, it's been written into our text. Like our scriptures were written in a patriarch, patriarchal context, and it's informed our theology, which then informs the way our church functions and informs the way the church engages with the world. And so some of the work we want to do is, is acknowledge some of the, the systems that have been created in our tradition, um, acknowledge them as, uh, as only telling us one part of the story and as central to how we understand our story. For example, Tertullian, who is an early church father, um, he once said in his, his work on the dress of women, he said, women are the devil's gateway. He said, you are the unsealer of that tree. You are the forsaker of the divine law. You are the one who persuaded him whom the devil was not brave enough to approach. You so lightly crushed the image of God, the man, Adam. And you hear stuff like this. This is a, this is a church father, someone who we've given authority in our tradition. And, and, and what he's saying is that women don't inherit the image of God like men do. If anything, they inhibit the, the image of God being played out through men. Now, not all church fathers or church historians believe this, but it's, it's, it's not unbelievably uncommon as well. And, and when we create this image that, that women are less than, they're not equal in, in the image of God perspective, then we can create systems where women are subject to men. Uh, and, and, and it fails to acknowledge the reality that women are the source of life in our world, that, that God chooses to use women as the primary conduits of God's continuing story through new life and rebirth. And um, we see women like the, the Samaritan woman in John 4, where Jesus' longest recorded theological discourse is with a woman. We, we encounter Mary. Jesus' mother is the primary, again, conduit of God's movement towards and among humanity. Women throughout the Gospels are constantly the ones who actually get it right. They're the, often the first to hear the news and the last who are entrusted with it. And so uh, women have so much to teach us. Women often are willing to bleed so others find life. I'm going to hand it to our panelists here uh, in one second. There, there's one woman named Manar um, who's a modern hero of mine, a prophet and peacemaker. She's a Palestinian Christian who lives in Bethany, has become dear friends of our family. And we were sitting with her um, a, a couple years ago, soon after a war that had a lot of impact on her family and friends. And we're talking about the hopelessness of the reality she was living in. And as she shared she, she talked about the role of women in her little village. And she said, for us, um, when we don't have hope, we create it. And she described the reality of turning on music and dancing with her kids in the kitchen as bombs are dropping and people are being killed and injured. When they don't have hope, they create it. These women who aren't necessarily behind the podiums of power um, are living into this creative, costly call of everyday peacemaking in ways that we, as men, need to listen up and get curious and ask good questions and understand from them what this life might look like. So with that, let me um, toss it to our panelists for a quick self-introduction, and then we'll get into some deeper uh, work from there. Kay, would you lead us off? 
Yes, hi everyone. My name is Kay Higuera Smith. I'm a professor of biblical and religious studies at Azusa Pacific University here in the Los Angeles area. Uh, my university is a evangelical university in the Wesleyan tradition. I teach on gender and culture, critical gender theory, critical race theory, and I'm very interested in questions of how our colonial heritage still shapes the way we we are, the way we think, the way we are in the world. So my most recent book is uh, Editor-in-Chief of Evangelical Post-Colonial Conversations, published by uh, InterVarsity Press. Awesome, thank you. Thrilled you're with us. And Rashida. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Rashida Washington. I am the Executive Director for Communities First Association which is a national faith-based organization that specializes in training, coaching, teaching, and consulting in asset-based community development and economic development and equity towards indigenous leadership and sustainability of communities. Um, and I am also the newly appointed Chief Experience Officer of Live Cafe, which is a grassrooted creative space and transformational experience cafe on the western side of Chicagoland that works very hard to bridge communities together and illustrate what happens when we practice asset-based community development, economic development, and equity well. Thank you for having me. Awesome, thanks Rashida. Uh, Idalette. Okay, hi, I'm Idalette McVicker and I am a mama bear. Um, I'm also a lioness. I am editor-in-chief at SheLovesMagazine.com, where we mobilize and empower women to transform our world together. And I get to be Mama Bear there. Also, I have three children. I am an immigrant as well. I was born and raised in South Africa during the apartheid story. And so um, that has just awakened me to a whole world of injustice and what is my part in that? So that's the question I live with. Um, and if you ask me my six word memoir, it's this, it's daughter of apartheid walks towards freedom. So that's, that's it. Ooh, love it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all three of you women for, for carving out this time with us. This is gonna be a significant, significant next 45 minutes. And so um, we wanna start off uh, with you, Kay. And, and Kay, this is such a gift to have you on this call with us. Um, I met Kay, seven or eight years ago now, when we were in Israel-Palestine, the first time I was actually there, and, and her leadership was so profound and provocative that for my wife and Jan and I, um, Kay has stayed at the center of our sights in regards to people to follow in this world of what it means to follow Jesus, and specifically around um, this reality of women in our scriptures, in our church history. And so would you, would you get us going on this? Like, help us unpack some of the historical and theological implications of of women as prophets and peacemakers. Yeah, there's so much to say. Uh, our scriptures are so full of stories of women as prophets and peacemakers. Uh, when you think of the women prophets, think of Miriam. Miriam is the first person in the Bible to be called a prophet, which is an amazing reality. She's the first person who was a major leader of the Israelites, first woman. Uh, she was the first woman to lead the uh, Israelites in worship. Um, Micah, the prophet Micah, thought so much of her that he wrote, uh, uh, God speaks in Micah and says, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So according to that tradition, Miriam was remembered as one of the three who ruled over the people of Israel. Uh, another really exciting um, aspect of Miriam is that she went into the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron indicating again this is a sacred place that only these three leaders were allowed access to. Her story gets kind of suppressed in our tradition. Another really fascinating prophet, and I could literally go on all day about women who are redeemers and peacemakers and whose stories get uh, suppressed, but I'll just uh, give you a couple. Uh, another is Hulda. Hulda is a prophet who is uh, sent to by King Josiah's priests because they find the scroll of the law, which we have to assume to be either the Torah or Deuteronomy, when they uh, remodel and rebuild the temple. And what they find there is, what we find in that story is that Huldah, a female prophet, is the one who must 
uh, authenticate this, this text, this scroll, in order for the people to give it authority. So the irony there is really thick because here you have this Bible who people have used it to deny women a voice and yet it wasn't accepted and it wouldn't even be here today if a woman had not uh, given approval. So the, the actual authority of the Bible rests on the approval of a woman. Um, there are peacemakers too. We think of Rahab. Um, not all the peacemakers, by the way, are peaceful. I mean, I think of the wise, uh, the, the um, Eshet Chochma, which means literally female uh, sage of Abel, Abel, who actually, in order to get peace, has the head of, uh, of, of uh, David's um, enemy cut off and thrown over the, wall, over the walls so that the society has peace. So women in the Bible have not always been peaceful peacemakers. Um, but we do have women like Abigail who, who make sure that the lives of people are saved. And we have women who often are advocating for the kingdom of God and for the perpetuation for the promises when men aren't around. And that's really important to know. That's true in history, too. Many of the women abbesses, the heads of the abbeys in the medieval period, were peacemakers. They, they worked as as diplomats and oversaw negotiations with kings and, and leaders in order to bring peace. These stories have been suppressed. And when my students hear about them, they, they are amazed that many of these stories in the Bible, they've read them over and over, but they've never either had a sermon preached on them or never had anyone uh, speak to these issues. So what have been the obstacles for us to see these stories. The biggest obstacle I contend is a cult of masculinity. And this is an ideology that claims that one segment of the population is divinely authorized for all time and in all circumstances to rule over another segment. Uh, that, claim, um, that claims that the ruling class or the ruling population is designed by nature to rule because they are more rational, they're less likely to be deceived. Ironically, we reject this ideology when it comes to the divine right of kings, but we accept the ideology in many cases and it persists when it comes to women and when it comes to black and brown bodies. Uh, so because of this ideology, for instance, some of these obstacles include translation issues. Junia in Romans 16, 7, who was, uh, her name was purposely changed in the 13th century to a male form because she's called an apostle there. And the, and the, and the tradents, the, uh, the, the scribes could not believe that a woman could be apostle. So rather than accept the plain text of scripture, they actually violated scripture and changed it in order to fit with the cult of masculinity. Phoebe, in Romans 16, 1 through 2, Paul calls a prostatis, which in every other form in uh, Greek literature means a ruling elder. Um, in the earlier translation, she, that, they translated that as a helper. It laid, now they translate it as a benefactor, but that still does not get to the real sense of the word. In 1 Corinthians 14, when it says uh, women should be subordinate, 1434, that word subordinate is the same word that is translated in English as subject to, found in 1 Corinthians 1432, and the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. And here, what, it, what, what uh, Paul is writing is that the woman should be subject to others. So that is, they should take their turn. And yet, because the, the, of this ideology, it get, a different word is used in translation and thus distorts what is really going on. So we're dealing with two things. We're dealing with wonderful narratives about women as, as peacemakers, as prophets, leaders, uh, women as... Um, as uh, redeemer figures, many, many women as redeemer figures in the Bible. Um, but we also are dealing with a cult of masculinity and ideology that can't imagine women in those roles and thus silences them and suppresses that narrative. Thank you, Kay. That's really helpful. Um, one, one more quick question before we, we move to Rashida. Uh, for those of us who are, are being awakened to some of the 
um, some of the filters we have and how we read the text and how that's interpreted into our theology and our church practice. Um, who are, or what are some really tangible ways we can continue to be made aware of that filter to, to actually see the way that Jesus sees women as we see in, in scripture? Um, there are great books out that, that help us see these. Some of the work of Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza is very important in that regard. Yep. Getting in reading groups where you read the text with a lens that purposely says, I'm going to take seriously the women, and I'm going to ask who is exercising agency in this story? Who is the active person in the story? So very briefly, for instance, in the, in the stories of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, you see that Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, these are the ones who are the active agents in the stories, and the male figures are actually incredibly passive. So yep. it's an exciting process to just read together with other like-minded people and, and challenge that lens and you'll be amazed what you'll see. I love it. I love it. That's been one of the, fat, as we're raising our kiddos, you know, we're, we're thinking about, yes, let's celebrate the patriarchs of our faith. Let's also celebrate the matriarchs of our faith. So my wife, Jan, is, is often rewriting some of the, the songs that we inherited of Father Abraham to sing Mother Sarah and then go, and go down the line. And, and that's some of the ways where we're acknowledging the, whole, the wholeness of our story rather than uh, one one slice of it. That's great, Kate. We'll we'll circle back to that. As you all are listening in, again, the Q and A function um, is at the bottom of your screen. As you're listening to Kate talk some history and theology, feel free to jump in and ask some questions on that. We'll have hopefully about ten minutes at the end to get back to Q and A, or we may be able to interact with your questions uh, via written word as well. Okay, Rashida, let's move um, to you. Rashida has become a dear friend and and colleague. Uh, especially in the last year or so, and, and her work in uh, Chicago is some of the most compelling and, and prophetic that I've seen and witnessed. She's also a, a coach and trainer. And um, so if you would invite us into, uh, you are leading on so many fronts. You're an executive director of an organization. You're starting a, a cafe that's this redemptive space in, in Chicago. You are a woman of color, and you are leading in the church. Like, help us understand some of the realities you face as a woman of color, as one who is leading the way as a prophet and a peacemaker? So um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think is um, taxing on a daily basis is the convolution that is created by systems of marginalization and oppression. Um, you, I, I find myself often in places where I, I'm asking myself, why have I been invited to be somewhere? Um, it is not always as easy to know um, when you carry multiple things, uh, multiple characteristics of um, marginalization. Also, not only why am I being invited, sometimes why am I not being invited? Or what is inviting tension? Um, what is inviting the challenge? Um, I think if I were only black or only a woman or only um, had experienced variances in socioeconomics in my life, it would be much easier for me to pinpoint and identify what is at play when and how. But carrying those three things together create an interesting dynamic um, in, in my leadership experiences. Um, and sometimes I'm being asked into those spaces to honor um, those parts of who I am, not even always knowing which part it is. Um, and sometimes I'm being asked into a space to examine um, almost scientifically um, those parts of who I am. And that becomes a much deeper, darker journey for me. Um, but the convolution that these systems of marginaliz marginalization and oppression have created not only make it difficult to discern or ascertain what's at play, it also creates a bit of an identity crisis, not just for myself, but for people who look and sound like me, um, determining is this racism or is it misogyny or is there something at play here, hierarchically speaking, socioeconomically, or is none of it at play and it just looks like the last time one of those three things were at play? Um, who is my ally and how do I really know? And 
as I build intimate relationships and I take journey over time uh, doing the work uh, in my own local community or in the national um, level as well, it takes time for people to reveal those parts of themselves as well. And so the taxing journey that is doing life with people and going a long way to determine one of these isms being at play is also something that creates tension, contention, and convolution in the ways in which I approach leadership. Um, so those are some of the challenges that I think I deal with on a regular basis. And how do you, you know, as you're talking about these different spaces in the, the internal script you have to go through as a woman of color leading in these contexts, like what are the ways that you keep yourself healthy in that? Like, how do you sustain yourself? What are the practices that you have to engage in to stay in the game? Because I know it's, it is a crazy time for someone like you to be doing what you're doing. Yeah, sometimes I don't sustain myself. I'll start there. Um, sometimes, and I, and I think in, more and more in spaces like these webinars, we need to name the fact that sometimes we crack up and freak out. Um, that's the way that we handle it some days, is that we don't. Um, and so I think we, we you know, as leaders in, in this work that we do, I think more often than not, we have to um, sort of handle it or do soul care and contemplative practices. Um, Kay talked a little bit earlier before we got, um, before we went live about prayer, um, having um, other colleagues in the work, which is why it is so important to be with just black women sometimes or to be with just women of color sometimes or to be with just women sometimes and to be with just black people sometimes because there is an alignment there um, that is um, refreshing and redemptive in ways that are necessary for me to do the work that I do. Um, but I think we also have to start, uh, as my great grandmother would say, sometimes we have to name the fact that the baby's ugly. And sometimes the baby's just ugly. Um, and I think as leaders, um, women leaders, the way to combat the superwoman motif is to name that sometimes shit falls apart. Um, and so I just, I'm, I'm hopeful that in this context of our country today, where the, we're seeing this resurgence of attention and vocalization around issues pertaining to all of us that happen to resonate with women, not women's issues. Issues that pertain to all of us that happen to resonate with women. I hope that in this um, seemingly new season that we will start naming that more prophetically. Um, in addition to naming tools and resources, also naming that sometimes in the dark, quiet places of my home, it's not pretty. And, and that it's not because, that the reason why those moments happen is because there are, A, not enough of us naming that as a reality, because we're not dealing with the intersections between race, gender, um, the shaming that comes along with um, psychoanalysis, psychology, and mental, uh, mental illness and mental health, um, and socioeconomics, and how all those things interplay. Um, I think we just increase the chances of us having those hard moments and not being equipped to address them. Because we tend to often compartmentalize it. Like, okay, today we're going to talk about the race issue, and tomorrow we're going to talk about the woman issue, and next week we're going to have experts on um, mental health and well-being. But when you're looking at a, at a, a human being, they're living that out holistically socioeconomics, all of those things are interplaying and we hardly take that holistic lens um, and take a real deep look at how those things are being interchanged and inter-affecting a person's life. Great. Thanks, Rashida. I, I want to lean in and ask some questions too about uh, ways that you're seeing, you know, we talk, we define peace as a holistic repair of severed relationship, whatever that relationship might be, it might be with myself, might be with God, might be with my neighbor, or my spouse. Um, but some of the vision I know that you have with Live Cafe there in Chicago is to actually be a space of healing, like to, to heal severed relationship on a, on a systemic level and also on an interpersonal level. Um, so when we get back to the q and I want to lean in and, and maybe hear a story or two of ways that you're seeing that. You as a peacemaker creating that kind of space for that, that healing, that peace to be made. 
Um, great, let's go to Idolette. And um, she is, uh, as she mentioned earlier, a movemental leader uh, with She Loves Magazine and represents the world in a lot of ways, uh, coming from South Africa and now living in Canada, very engaged with US Christians. And we got to, um, she, she joined us for our first ever uh, Amplify, which is a new initiative that Global Immersion has started. It's uh, called a Peacemaking Pilgrimage for Women. So it's focused on developing a robust theology for women in scripture and the identity of the reconciled beloved. And then what does it mean now to live as everyday peacemakers? And we do that by going to Israel, Palestine and learning about these matriarchs in our text and the ways that modern peacemakers are living like that. And so to accompany um, Idolet in that space was so great. And to hear the stories of ways that women throughout her network are actually living this out in some of the most compelling and subversive and provocative and costly ways uh, imaginable gave us a glimpse into um, the reality that this isn't a movement that's just beginning. It's one that's far underway. And so Elad, if you would, if you would uh, lean into that, like help us understand ways that women are beginning to rise and have been rising and how that movemental shift is unfolding through She Loves. Right. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I think the whole, the, the movement of She Loves was really started because I saw a silence of women. I saw a silencing. So coming out of my own story, when we're dealing with silence, for me, to create the, and to call out the stories of women is, is, is really um, to stand against that silencing of women, right? So when we start asking women to just tell their stories, start writing your stories, come and stand in this place, tell your story. And we do that on a daily basis. And then what happens then is a woman writes her story and then other women come alongside her and it becomes a safe and a sacred space. And we support each other and we, and we see the good and, the, and the, um, we see the strength in each other. And it becomes, as you keep showing up, that those stories become, um, become strength, right? And we see and we hear stories of women who wrote their first, their first post that they ever submitted to She Loves. And, and then they become now writing books and um, are, are becoming, uh, creating conferences, right? And... Um, studying theology and, and just, but they did that first step. It was just writing that blog post and submitting it to us. And then, and it, it seems so, sometimes it's like, well, it's a blog post. But then we see that coming out of silence is really a wrestling, right? And when we're talking about women as peacemakers, the first thing I think, like one of the, the key elements I'm seeing is women's voices, right? Because what patriarchy does, what racism does, what oppression does, is it silences, right? And so for us as a movement, we're, that, this is our resistance. We show up, we bring our voices, and then now we're amplifying women's voices as well, right? And so, um, and there's so much healing that happens in that. Um, even in my own story, I remember, I remember wrestling for every word, trying to write a story sometimes, right? And, and really reckoning with the fact that this is a silencing that I'm also standing against. And so when I write a sentence and when I speak from my heart and when I show up, it really means I, this is my resistance. I, am, I refuse to be silenced. And then we call out the voices of women. And so for us as a movement, it's it really based on, um, there is a verse in Psalm 68, 11, where it says, the, the Lord gives the word of power and throngs of women carry the good news. And I want to see throngs of women, throngs of voices rising, right? And it's in everyday ways. It's not necessarily, I mean, it, it's however the strength that is within us. And so we see that. Um, and then we see women, I think the healing part in the broken relationship is we're also healing each other, right? Because I think there's healing that needs to be done with us as women. And so um, we did an event last year. And one of our women was telling a story of, of really, um, awful abuse it was really hard for her to tell it was the first time she was telling the story publicly so for her coming out of silencing it was it was it was a big deal and she was telling it to a room full of women and as she was you could see her wrestling within herself and as she was standing there one of our women stood up and she went and stood be behind her and she just had her hands she didn't even have her hands on her she just stood behind her and she was praying for her and you could see how one woman was lending strength to another and for me, that is a picture of peacemaking, right? We're healing this, we're healing this silencing, we're healing the broken relationships between ourselves so that then we can also move out and, and be, begin to heal broken relationships in our world, right? 
Um, and so another way that I've seen that we recently had um, a gathering, we called it Rise Up Sister. And I think for many women coming to our Rise Up Sister event was, was a Rise Up moment. Um, and one woman specifically, um, when she walked into the room, um, I could see her, just, she, it was very hard for her to be there. And, and I, I asked her permission if I could share the story and she said, absolutely. And um, it, was, it, was, it was hard for her to be in a space with women. And I talked about how we have to go back to our first mother, how we have to go to Eve as uh, the woman, uh, uh, she's um, the mother of all life, right? And I remember in my own story how I couldn't even look at Eve. I didn't want to behold her because in my, she had betrayed us. So that was the story I was told, right? Growing up in a patriarchal society. And I realized if I had to make peace with women, I had to start with Eve. I had to look at my mother, Eve, and I had to behold her and I had to see her through the eyes of Jesus. And I had to say, Eve, meet your sister, Grace, and we can move together and we can and now I love her and I see her through different eyes, but it's that, it's that thing. We have to make peace there too, right? And so the stories that we're told about who women are, or what we've done, right? That, that they're truly in quote that you, that you said. Um, and so this woman walked in and, and, and we talked about, you know, making peace with Eve and that we make peace with each other. And that is part of this, that we belong to each other. Um, and one of the, the, the key things that how I live my life now is, growing up in South Africa, growing up during apartheid, coming out, out of my blindness and out of being part of an oppressive system, I learned um, the concept of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu means I am because you are. And it means we belong to each other. And because your humanity and my humanity, we're connected to each other, we're tied to each other. And I can say it as a woman who, 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 who was privileged and who who received all the privileges of oppression, that my freedom is tied to the freedom of my brothers and sisters who were oppressed. And so as I untie those cords, um, I learned that we cannot have others be oppressed because we are connected to each other, right? And so when that one woman walked into our room and we talked about how we're connected to each other, it was beautiful to watch how, as we set the stage for this is how we're gonna be with each other. We're gonna be women who love. We're gonna be women who um, create space for each other. We're gonna be women who call out the good in each other, who call out the strength and the voice and, and the goodness and the kindness in each other. And this is how we wanna be as a way of life in this world. And uh, we set the stage for that. And I watched as the women in the room take, took care of each other. And at the end of the weekend, um, we, uh, she, she wrote us an email and she said, I had been really hurt by women. And um, she wasn't allowed to tell her story. She wasn't allowed to, but in our space, women wanted to hear her story. And women sat with her and, and this, you know, we were just sitting with each other. Let's just be honest, right? Like we were just, but I was so thankful because we could have so easily messed that up. And yet when we start making and we're saying, this is how we're going to be together and women start moving into that and you see the freedom that comes from that and that the peacemaking that comes out of that, because that is also peacemaking, right? This is the repair of broken relationships too. And now she's rising in her own way, right? And so this is for me, everyday peacemaking. Um, let me see, uh, John, do I have time? Cause I was, um, no. like a mi about a minute or so, okay. whatever you can squeeze in that. And then we'll, it'll come back to you here in a minute too. That's fine. Um, one of the things that John was asking me was, was well, how am I inspired by the movement of, of peacemaking in South Africa? And, um, and I have, I really look to the women of the black sash in South Africa. There's just a peacemaking movement a resistance movement that started um, in South Africa in response to the immoral past laws that were created in South Africa, where men had to, black men in South Africa had to, had to carry a pass with them at all times. And so it restricted movement, um, it was dehumanizing, it was racist. Um, and then the government said, well, now we're gonna put these past laws, women have to carry them as well. And so the black sash, the women of the black sash mobilized and they said, no way. 
now that you're now that you've struck a woman you have struck a rock so 20,000 women mobilized in 1956 and they marched up to the union buildings in Pretoria and it was what I love about it it was a cross race it was a cross denomination it was a peaceful resistance and they came to the union buildings and actually they bowed down in prayer and they delivered their their protest and the song they were singing was this, you strike a woman, you strike a rock. Because when we're, yeah. And so I think for me, that inspires me when we are looking at injustice in our world, women can rise and we're saying enough, no more. When you strike a woman, you strike a rock. Beautiful. Thanks, Idolette. And I, I think, um, Idolette, I'll probably toss this one back to you here in a few minutes. There's a question from Hannah. Thanks for that question. And Carrie, um, has a question as well about recommended books. Uh, Kay, any of you would be great to interact with. Um, Carrie posted that right after you had talked, Kay, so maybe if you could make sure to get something on there. Um, and we'll offer in the follow-up email some suggested resources and uh, a couple lectures to watch and books to read and such. Um, but it would be great for you to, to interact um, in a few minutes also with this question from Hannah. I think it's a critical one and one we wrestle with a lot as a peacemaking training organization where Peace is often stigmatized as something of an ideal that sits at 30,000 feet. And it's an otherworldly kind of unicorn reality. And we would say peacemaking is some of the most subversive and costly realities of discipleship. If we mean we're going to follow Jesus into the center of conflict, uh, it's going to look more like a cross than it is a sword. And that's that's not an easy call. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on that, Ilette, um, as specifically with this, this women and warrior peacemaker dynamic that Hannah brings up. Um, let me go back to, to UK with this, with this question. Um, acknowledging that, that women are at the epicenter of this peacemaking movement, although not behind as many podiums and platforms as many um, men or others with power, but are subversively living this stuff out. What does it look like? Um, and, and what is your hope for the future of, of seeing women rise as Edelette describes as prophets and peacemakers in our world? Well, I think central to our, to our rising into those roles is recognizing again, this ideology, this cult of masculinity that, uh, that gets in the way. Because in that cult, the ideal, the norm that gets set is to win. Whereas Jesus in his preaching of the kingdom offered a whole different way of being human in the world. And for women and for people of color, we have been on the outside, we have been on the periphery of this ideological world. And uh, to, we can speak to it from that space because we understand not only the physical violence, but the social violence. Uh, in terms of physical violence, women and girls are the greatest victims of war, of, of, um, of the cult of masculinity in general. In terms of social violence, um, Rashida gave examples of the kind of uh, microaggressions, the kind of ways that one lives one's life in a way that is constantly questioning and constantly having to interpret uh, it's exhausting, not to mention the, the ways that women and people of color sometimes have internalized uh, the message of the, of, of the um, uh, ideological center. So we, from that social space, have an important voice. And the irony of an ideology is, in some ways, you can identify it because it just makes no sense. It makes no sense that virtually half our population have no voice. I mean, just common sense would tell you that, that as we begin, we want to hear more and more voices. And as women and, and representing women and girls, the ones who are the, the most uh, acted upon in terms of violence, we have to have a voice as Idolette has brought out how important that is. Awesome, thank you, Kay. Rashida, would you interact with that? Yeah, I just, I think um, what Kay just said was, was right, I think. Um, there are tons of systems at play, and um, as I think about even the topic for today, which is profit and peacemaker, um, and the role that women play in that, I think we have an extraordinary capacity to marry um, prophetess to peacemaker. Um, I think that maybe in ways that it hasn't been done before, because 
from the beginning of time, it's only ever been foundationally structured to be done one way. Um, we were never a part of the narrative um, or crafting of the model that is now the representative for our, our country and our world. But that women don't just have the capacity to give voice, right? What Idola talked about was, yes, giving voice, but it was transformational voice, right? Like things changed. People physically started moving their bodies in that moment. Um, there was an energy that was created that wasn't just, it, it wasn't just in the room. It wasn't energy sitting. It wasn't people at rest. It, a woman got up and moved to another woman. And so I often find it interesting how often the, the, in, our, in our work and in our world, we talk about how we want a movement. We want a movement. We want a movement so bad, so badly. But we're, we're telling our narrative. We're talking. We're venting. But we're not marrying the prophetic voice with the capacity to make peace. Um, as I think about peacemaking, we use this word peacemaking almost metaphorically, right? Like it's just going to pop out of somewhere. We have to actually do the work of making peace, right? And so um, using our voices and marrying the power of our prophetic voice to conciliation. And I say conciliation and not reconciliation because women were never part of the original equation. Um, not just to vent, but to actually create a kinetic transformational power um, is something that I believe all women have the capacity to do. Um, and I name it particularly for women because I think that men have a lot to learn if they're willing to take a posture of learning from how to tie the prophetic to the peacemaking activity. Um, and one of the questions you had posed to me earlier, John, was about, you know, what do people and places and things need to do to prepare themselves to have women in leadership, particularly in the church? And I think the first question we have to ask is why we want it at all. Do we want it because we, we think Jesus wants it, which is not the same as us wanting it, but we got to check it off the box so Jesus will be pleased. Do we want it because it's sort of the hot, trendy thing to do? in our evangelical and denominational circles. Now we have to say we had some of them, right? Um, and then also, if we really want it for the authentic gift that it is, what are we willing to put in place and how are we willing to posture ourselves to receive that gift, right? So that we're not just welcoming women in leadership or women's prophetic voice or peacemaking capacity into what already is, but they're, we're willing to make space and room for it to be there present fully and authentically to create the transformation it was intended to create. I think all those things kind of go hand in hand. So good. Thank you, Rashida. Idole, I see you nodding and waving. You jump in. What do you got, what do you got going on over there? She's just getting my come on, you know. I just want to like, woo, <laughs> preach, Rashida. I love it. Oh. This is awesome. This kinetic. Oh, just like ah, that's good. Yeah, I love it. I love the idea. But we have to marry the peacemaking and the um, yeah, uh, with the prophet. I agree with you. Um, and sometimes, sometimes this idea of peacemaking isn't necessarily just like what um, what you were asking Hannah about. You know, sometimes peacemaking addresses addresses the pain, addresses the the injustice in the room, and and I'll I'll tell you. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable, and um, and I, I'll I'm going to tell you a story. So, um, I was at a gathering, and um, we we were sitting in a room together, and these were beautiful people, um, friends. Some, these were my we were, we were friends, and. Um, we we were kind of do some worship together and uh, this was uh, um yeah so we were gathering together as leaders and we were going to do worship and prayer and we walked into the room and the room was not set up um as it was it was meant to be a circle and we were all kind of gathering around as a circle but it wasn't set up properly and and this is and we have to be intentional about that and so i mean this is just a learning for me too but we walked into the room and I recognized that in the center of the room was also the center of power, basically, like, um, like um, uh, mostly white and mostly male. And then on the, on the margins of the circle was um, African-American um, women 
and we kind of positioned ourselves on the on the edges of the margins right and we were entering into this time of worship and my heart was beating i was like oh no okay god what am i going to do because i realized i couldn't enter into worship together in that moment recognizing the inequality in the circle recognizing how the room was structured in an unequal way and i'm just at this point in my life i'm just I'm just done with inequality, right? Like, I'm just like, I'm gonna speak up when in these moments. And I think this is part of peacemaking because sometimes we walk away from this and you're like, man, that was really uncomfortable. Um, what can I do? But the, the, my friend started, started doing, and it actually, I mean, she started playing her guitar. We entered into worship and I, my heart was beating. I'm like, I gotta do something. And so I tapped her in the middle of worship. I tapped her on the shoulder and I was like, I am so sorry but this room right now is not full of peace. Like this room is not set up in the proper way. And so I, I asked the leaders in the room, can we just enlarge the circle? Can we just open up the circle, please? And everybody realized in that moment what was going on. And so we just moved the chairs, we, everybody moved out and now everybody was in the circle. And it felt to me like the room went, <sighs> right? And it was like, okay, this is peacemaking too. And sometimes it means calling out the pain, naming the, the ugly baby, right? Naming the ugly baby and say, no, 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 no. Right now, right in this moment, we're gonna make peace. And it must, may not feel so comfortable. And it means you may be ruffling some feathers, but I'm just done, I'm just done with the, the ugly baby not being named, right? And so for me, that's part of peacemaking. And so sometimes it is not, it's not, it's for me, peacemaking is not doormat theology, right? That's not what Jesus told us to do at all. So there we go. So good, and that, that's a critical piece. Um, if we're gonna talk about this work of, of peacemaking, it's really critical that we communicate and re-communicate and over-communicate that peace is not passive. For us, as we understand peacemaking and this journey towards it, like the arc of a holistic peace requires that we confront injustice and we have to be people who pursue and stand in the way of the bulldozers that are flattening people. And it's often bulldozers that are flattening women when, they, when these structures are off. And so to be peacemakers is to speak boldly and prophetically and it's going to cost, but it's what brings this new life. You know, and this, this picture of women and my, my wife often, who's way ahead of me on all this stuff, talking about this, describes, she's like, John, you always talk about the cross um, and then of course resurrection, but what about the womb? What about the sacredness of the womb? That's where life, um, that, that, that's where new birth comes about. That's where Jesus actually, God takes human form. And so allow the new life to come into our world and to, to get to the new life. We, um, we have to both acknowledge the death, but celebrate the, what, what is coming in front of us. And so it does feel like it's this tension. The peacemakers are the ones that move into the costly, into the, the death of sorts to see this resurrected, this, this womb reality um, created in our world. I want to go back to, we have a couple of questions here. Could I answer we have six that? minutes. Um, there's a great question from Anjali about uh, resources. So books are helpful. Videos are helpful. More helpful are groups and dialogues and experiences. For us, that's, that's why we created this Amplify Peacemaking Initiative with some of these unbelievable women uh, who have informed it. You three represent, I'm sure, groups and dialogues and experiences. What else would you add in response uh, to Anjali? I'm actually working on a um, grant right now for Sunday school materials and materials for pastors with the uh, uh, Institute for Asian American Christianity. So we, we recognize that there really is a dearth of good materials out there and, and uh, we're working on it. I would just add um, to infuse those two things. As one who is in love with all things academic and literary, I also hate them to pieces because we get stuck there often. Um, and so if we can take those things and marry them to the things that John talked about, actual experiences with actual human beings. I recently wrote a grant um, to create um, an opportunity for 15 women thereabouts called Dias Diaspora Hughes where it is a book club that are for, that's for women of color, but instead of only doing a book a month, which would only get us through 12 books, 
we're doing a reader with 20 authors to expose them to the voices of so many more women. But then we're also taking a retreat for them to begin writing their own stories and create a reader of their own, just to mirror the idea that it's not some far away group of very fancy pants women who are writers and voice givers, but that it's those of us who raise babies and don't, and live in community and don't, and have professions and don't, and are called to ministry and aren't, or whatever, who come together and just write it down and make it clear. Um, so in that, we are learning from reading and from experiencing text, but we're learning so much more from just being in the room with one another and experiencing one another on a journey together that has implicit tension. I think that um, one of my favorite books um, was written by Dr. Shanika Walker Barnes called Too Heavy a Yoke. And what I love about it, obviously is a book and I love books and I love those tools and resources, but that it is so gritty in experience. What she's writing about is the experiences that women have had in the church. Um, and unless we start to bump up against some of those experiences, Ida Led did a really good job of talking about how women also need to reconcile some things with women. And unless we get in the room together to do some of that, I think we're maybe continuing to um, abandon our need for some deconstruction of our own. Yeah, for me, for me, my healing definitely happened in, in, um, in community. Uh, when I recognized, um, uh, when I started healing my whiteness, or recognized my, um, just the, the deep wounding of racism. I, I specifically planted myself in community and I found community at the Amahoro gathering and first and just kept planting myself there. And then um, just, and then seeing what, where relationship opens up, right? Um, so often people are asking me, okay, so I've seen injustice. I want to do something. Um, what, like, how, how can I get involved? And I, and I, I think it's like, okay, it's going to be okay. Find relationships, see where relationships opens up. Sometimes we have to place ourselves in, in those places, um, but watch where relationship opens up. And then the second thing is find a circle, right? We find a circle. Um, my healing happens in circles uh, where everybody's equal. Uh, we sit together, I have, we have a, a, a She Loves Circle where we meet every second Thursday with women and where we practice, how do we love each other well? How do we walk, you know, how do we life, do we do life together? And so um, find a circle. Beautiful, thank you, Idalette. Kay, I don't know if you saw my message there. Were you gonna add something earlier that I missed before I conclude? Yeah, when you were talking about the womb, I, I just wanted to point out that that is really supported in scripture because uh, the, you know, we have the famous term El Shaddai. The word Shad in Hebrew means breast. So God is the God who, works, who nurtures us at the breast. The word Rachamim, which is where we get our word mercy, it comes from the word for womb. So God nurtures us at the breast. God gives birth to us. Uh, God has a womb. And, and God gives birth. We are told the rock who bore me. So God actually births us. So these metaphors that are part of the, of the very way that God is described in scripture, again, are suppressed and are so important to recover, uh, to understand God's, God's real nature. May those metaphors uh, fuel and inspire us forward, friends, and grateful for each one of you on this call, Rashida, Idalette, Kay, your contribution to this movement on so many different levels, um, theologically and missiologically and as practitioners and as, uh, as moms and as friends, um, you inspire and you create space for us to have these conversations and to learn like crazy. And for me, as, as a white guy, like I, I am more shaped by your perspectives and lives uh, than most others and, and want to continue to do that. And I invite all my brothers to do the same. May we, may we listen seeking to understand rather than to be understood and, 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 and may women no longer be silenced by the systems and structures that oppress. And may churches create space to be restructured and rebirthed into ways that see men and women as co-image bearers so that we can have a fuller understanding of what God is doing in our world. And may the next generation, may our kiddos uh, be the ones who are the peacemakers who usher in the world that God continues to make through us. So 
Um, all of you that are with us, grace and peace to you. Thank you for joining this um, webinar. Thanks for engaging this content. The questions, the discomfort, all that stuff, acknowledge it. Feel free to interact um, with us through um, our email. We'll have a follow-up email with some resources, with information of, uh, for these women and the associations they're connected to so you can keep in touch. Um, much love, friends. Talk soon.